to start us off, I thought if you could tell us a bit more about your journey into film and through film, because you've worked across TV and documentaries and you've made some short films. Um, if you can tell us a bit more about how that all started. Yeah, so um, filmmaking came late to me. I mean, I guess it's late in that it wasn't like a childhood um, obsession. Um, I was actually in university studying um, Arabic language and Middle East politics and it um, had this eureka moment when I, late one night when I was um, trying to conjugate Arabic verbs and realizing it was really hard and not very me, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that I'd made a big mistake in my life and the only times I'd been happy was when I'd been like writing poetry when I was a teenager, taking photographs, which was something I'd always done. And so I thought, well, what job combines photographs and poetry and words and language and people? And then a light bulb came on in my mind and I thought, well, it's film. And it had never occurred to me that it was an option before that moment. So then uh, I guess the next however many years was me trying to find a route into it. Mm. And being someone self-taught, it was um, initially uh, being a trainee for this uh, theatre director. Um, where it was a very practical on the ground learning for a year, um, being like an assistant almost and doing kind of directing. Um, that's a whole other separate mm -hmm. thing. But I did that for a year and then just working in the industry. So my USP was always being half Egyptian. And so I found my way into documentaries. Mm. So I worked on documentaries as what in those days they called a self-shooting AP and um, did that for a few years. Then I moved, um, really knew that fiction was where I wanted to be um, and it ended up getting into um, the production um, to, um, office, uh, initially starting as a production assistant, then a production coordinator uh, for a number of years and then moving more onto the content side when I was like a script editor mm -hmm. at BBC for a number of years and then re reached that point where it had been like 11 years, 10, 11 years of working in the industry and still not fully making my own films that um, I thought, and I think maybe this is just um, differing personalities, but I always, because I hadn't gone to film school, thought there's so much I have to learn. Mm. Um, and then you reach that point where you think, actually, I know it all. Mm -hmm. So why am I not just doing it? And so I drew a line, um, I made some life changes mm. and it um, ended up making some shorts and very quickly after that made my feature. Well, I say very quickly, it was eight years. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned that you worked in documentaries. How do you think your experience in, in documentary and, and non-fiction filmmaking has led into sort of storytelling and fiction? Yeah, um, very heavily because making docs was my film school. So, um, you know, in, in it was often a very small team. Um, you know, you'd... I'd be doing all the research, then I'd go out on the ground and find that research is one thing, but what the reality is, is very different. And so you often are thrown into a situation with you, one camera, one sound, and it's um, having to improvise, uh, think on your feet, light something instantly, like with no <laughs> equipment, mm. and it, um, in a way get what you need out of someone in a sensitive way. Um, as quickly as possible often. Mm. So, you know, using my Arabic language skills, a lot of the docs I worked on were in the Middle East. Mm. And so, you know, I, I did the, like this one in uh, Baghdad during the war. And I probably learned the most on that one because you can be there as a news crew and um, very, um, uh, like wear flak jackets and be very um, obvious and visible. But we chose to go undercover and so we, you know, used a taxi rather than something with the, that showed who we were. And I sat in the front and we were very subtle mm. and low key. And so we were able to get interviews and go places that otherwise we wouldn't have. Mm. And having to show up, think on your feet, get what you need, like that guerrilla style goes, <laughs> it, it, it goes, it leads straight into indie filmmaking, really. Mm. And just looking specifically at your fiction films and your feature films, My Brother the Devil and The Swimmers, um, there seems to be a sort of very sp specific community in both and um, a very authentic depiction of it. And you mentioned that it took eight years to make the, your first feature film. What, you know, how do you, you know, I also get the sense that there's a very collaborative ap approach to making these films. How do you, what do the research in terms of learning really to capture the stories and environments in a very authentic way? 
Yeah, I mean, that's probably um, one of the, well, it is the most important thing to me because My Brother the Devil, the, the journey towards that film could have taken half the time mm. if I'd settled um, and had settled for changes to the screenplay that I felt weren't correct, mm. settled for um, not fully, not fully being as authentic as it could have been. Mm. So there were compromises that could have been made and the film would have been made more quickly. But for me, nobody wants to make a fake, you know, I, I never want to make a fake film. Mm. And I think it's having the humility to know that you aren't the expert. And so a lot of that documentary research as the first step before you go and sh shoot and uh, um, be on the ground as such, it, I think I take that into filmmaking. Mm. So with My Brother the Devil, I remember having a go at that first draft of the script and thinking, I'm a fraud, I can't write this. You know, this, ha you know, I can't do this yet. So I then went and found the real boys that this was going to be based on and I spent time with them and I hung out with them. And, you know, Eamon Hamducci, who is um, my consultant and, you know, essentially I learned a language mm. by spending a lot of time with him and his friends and, you know, meeting boys in different groups in, you know, Hackney and um, Islington and um, Brixton. And so once I reached a point where I felt that I could hear the characters talking, that was actually in my head, that was where I could actually write the script. And I wrote it in that way and had a glossary that went along with it. Mm. And that was another stumbling block for getting it financed because it was all written in that way. Mm. And what drew you to that s story about telling the story of these boys in London? And mm. Well, it, it came from me attending things like this and people saying, oh, you should um, <laughs> uh, film something you know and something within your means. And I had spent all these, you know, like a decade uh, mm. working across many mediums and in different jobs. And I made a very small short film, then a slightly more ambitious short film. And then I wrote three very ambitious short films and then failed to get any funding for any of them. Mm. So they were each probably should have been features, each of them, but I had like crammed them into like 20 minute films mm. and was submitting <laughs> them to everywhere and just got rejected from everything. And so then I thought, well, what am I doing here? Wasting my time in this space. I just need to start working on the feature. Mm. So I live on a council estate in Hackney. Let's set something on a council estate in Hackney. Okay, um, what can I bring to this environment? And so it came from a complete practical place mm -hmm. in terms of the world of the film. I mean, we ended up filming it 10 minutes from where I live, yeah. but, um, or lived at the time, but um, I genuinely thought I'd be filming it in my flat with, mm -hmm. <laughs> with my neighbors and people I knew. And what do people say to you when you have those ideas in terms of creating something practical or even pitching your scripts? Is there ever a response of, that's not how you make films? Uh, not, not really, but I guess the stumbling block for me was always, you, you know, people often say that I'm too ambitious. Mm. You know, that's what's something that I've heard a few times. Um, I never felt it was a negative thing myself, mm -hmm. but um, said in such a way that it seems negative, like being unrealistic or too ambitious. Mm. Um, and it's, yeah, if you have that attitude, you'll never make a film. Yeah. You've done <laughs> because, it. <laughs> yeah. Because you, you kind of have to have those traits yeah. to, it's, it's a slog. Yeah. And as you're both um, a writer and a director, what's... I'm quite curious to hear more about your process for both, if it's a separate thing or if, if it's quite sort of intertwined, but also about that time between a script being finished and you being on set and filming. What what does that transition look like for you? Yeah, well, the, the, the learning curve really in, in that regard was My Brother the Devil, because um, in that process of trying to get that film made, I mean, that was a completely independent film, as in no public money, mm. no big organizations mm. behind it so it's something I'm very proud of because it was rejected from everywhere and we still persevered and made it um, for half a million pounds um, and so um, that eight years <laughs> um, I realized that a script is just a selling document mm -hmm. it's not actually a film mm. and it's you know you in the beginning I was just putting everything that I saw in my head on the page and I'm probably still a little, like many writer directors, a little guilty of that. But it's something I'm trying to do less mm -hmm. because my realization and th you know that this is really um, a selling document to get to approximate the film in order to get money. 
and there's a, a, there's a rhythm to that. Mm -hmm. There's certain things that have to happen at certain points. There's a way it has to pull someone in and get them to read it to the end. Mm. Um, and you can hint at the images, you can say things, you know, like in the script, but ultimately it's like having a blueprint and then building a house. Mm. If it's raining the whole time you're doing that, it's gonna be a different house, mm. you know? So <laughs> um, it's um, separating those two things. Mm. And I think the prep always is going towards the film. So, you know, there's small things like I like to make playlists um, of music that, um, that I play while I'm writing that is the soundscape of the film or music that a certain character will listen to. So I, I use that a lot. Mm. Um, I like to be very documentary and to go to the real places and meet the real people and involve the real people as much as possible mm. because that's when you know, I've always had a radar for fake and reality. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, film is fake. It's, it's but you want to create an honest lie. Mm -hmm. And so it's how you, um, you do that. And, and I think when you see real, it's very, you, you know, you know what the bar is that you're trying to achieve. Mm. So also in swimmers, you know, it's it, one of the most important things was bringing Syrians onto the production, yeah. you know. Um, it's knowing that you don't know or having the humility, I guess, to know you don't know at times. Mm. In terms of, uh, just go back on what you said about music, because that was one of my questions, is uh, I rewatched My Brother Devil recently, and uh, we've, we've talked about this before, the music and the swimmers, and just how specific it was, and that there was quite a lot of, um, it's a harrowing film, but you still managed to make it feel really joyful and sort of hopeful. And rewatching My Brother Devil, there was a similar feeling, but, of, but the music being, you know, completely different. And so, like you said, so perfect for the characters. Um, what, you know, how do you start that journey? How much time do you spend on curating these playlists? A lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and also, you know, casting a mix of people from the real world, um, you know, from the and and actors, mm. you know, you, you know, you listen to what they're listening to, and you know, um, it's it's really having all your five senses open when you're in that world to then take it um, like a magpie almost, and put it into the movie and mm. and channel it into the movie. Um, but yeah, my brother the devil was a perfect example because we were so low budget, we had zero money mm. and most of the tracks on there are what boys have recorded in their bedrooms mm -hmm. um and so you can hear that <laughs> i noticed i was oh this is, sounds like someone <laughs> i would know would record this or like it's, it sounds very sort of you know it's not um it's so wildly different from like a sia hit song that you use in the swimmers for example and you mentioned casting which um i'd really love to hear more about your process in terms of casting what you're looking for um and also I mean, with my brother Devil, Letitia Wright is, you know, Black Panther now. <laughs> like, what was that in terms of casting my brother the Devil and and also the swimmers? I mean, like like every director, you're looking for the best people for the role. Mm. And for me, it's just being very open to actors um, and not, you know, first time actors. I prefer to call them first time actors. I was about to say non actors, which I don't like actually. Mm. <laughs> um, but first time actors, um, and it's. Yeah, it's, it's having both channels open because mm. you want to be open to both sides because you, you don't want to put your own preconceived ideas of... It's not a situation where I'm always like, oh, it has to be um, first-time actors and people really from the world, but mm. the actors have to be skilled enough to translate that authenticity as well. And often I've found in both those films, a mix mm. was the best way forward. Mm. But ultimately it's, um, yeah, just looking for the the best people. So did you have open auditions for? Yeah, for both. Okay. Yeah, so you do street casting and then also take more traditional routes in terms of um, auditioning actors mm. as well. Excellent. Uh, we've actually got um, two clips from My Brother the Devil, which are from, we're going to play, um, in case you haven't seen in a while, just a little reminder of what that film looks like. and. Um, so the, the scenes are actually far apart. One is sort of in the beginning of the film and then the second one is at the end of the film, but it's, they're both around the dinner table and having dinner. So we can have a look at that now, please. Uh. 
بابا صباح الخير يا عبد العزيز I had another drink sleeping on my bus. It's so hot. We need to buy fan. Muhammad, how much fan in Argos? I don't know. You got the catalogue, man. Do I look like Wikipedia? Wiki? Rashid! Who Rashid, Habib, and Lechem? How will you have? In Mansoura, when it was hot, we would sleep on the roof. Yeah, but we're in England, Dad. We don't sleep on roofs. That's why they're built like that, with a point. I ain't sleeping on a roof. In Cairo, we buy fans. It's the best way to sleep. What is? Mansoura. All right. I'm done. Oh, rush, man. Hey, boys. I didn't sleep the entire 18 days. The revolution brought out the true Egyptian, the Egyptian we didn't see since Nasser. Cool, cool, yeah, cool. Oh, shukran. Just like my mother's cooking. Um, you know, I saw this Illuminati thing on YouTube that they want like a, a one world government and like a new world order so they can control everything because like Obama, he's the boss man. No, Obama, no, for you. No, it, it, it. Did the revolution make you want to go back? Well, I wanted to go back, but it's not easy. I have work, bills, school. What can an old man do? Yes, but we need to get more involved in the democratic process. Why else did we end up here? We didn't end up here, we was born here. Hey, don't talk about stuff you don't understand, yeah? Thank you for offering Rashid the job. Oh, no, no, it's okay. I have so much work coming up, so it has been really great having his help. So what, you think you're like the Gandhi of Hackney or something? Hey, shut up, man. What did I tell you before? Yeah? yeah? Hey, this politics shit is bullshit, man. If it's so good, then why is there still wars? Sit down. Why are politicians liars, man? Allahu <laughs> alam I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. There's so much going on, and, and, you know, in both scenes, you get, you know, the dad telling, talking about this person that fell asleep on his butt. You know, you get sort of a whole backstory in, in a very, um, you know, sort of sh short clips. Um, and just sort of interested in, in you know, there's also the, this idea of, like, dual identity and heritage, and this is the culture clash of that all. Um, which we see in the swimmers as well, especially when um, the refugees arrive to so-called safe space that isn't safe at all for them and that they're really being rejected from. Um, how do you think that you're, you know, you mentioned that you're um, half Egyptian and Welsh. How do you think that dual heritage and identity feeds into your filmmaking and storytelling? Watching that really obviously, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I guess, you know, being a half-half, as many half-halves um, or people with multiple uh, belongings um, would feel, um, you're never really fully one thing or the other. And so you're always a bit of an outsider in both worlds and in all worlds. And it helps you to see the other sides of the coin. So um, it certainly um, informed my view of things and I guess also this idea that I never really have an answer or try to give an answer, but can see both sides of an argument and feel that both have their right bits and wrong bits. Mm. And it, um, things are always a shade of gray, I guess, never definitively one thing or another or black and white. Um, and so I'd hope that, um, I, think, I think that's allowed me to empathize, you know, with, with both sides of something. Um, and often, ironically, because we were talking about my beginnings in the industry, in the documentary things I was doing, I embodied that role. Mm -hmm. So I was often, you know, because my USP was this half Egyptian side of myself, um, my first jobs were in production companies where executives back in the UK would decide a subject matter or a topic. And then I would be that person who would go and research it. Mm -hmm. And it, then we'd go out into the field 
and I would be that in-between person who was into doing the interviewing and the filming um, interviews, um, but could see, could identify and feel and belong with those in front of the camera and those behind the camera. And whenever there was conflict or disharmony with those two sides, it would be my role to be that diplomat mm. in the middle and to smooth things over and make both sides understand each other and okay. Yeah. And um, so it's interesting, I've just thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a healthy gap between um, my brother Devil and the swimmers of about 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, not going to ask why, because <laughs> I think sometimes in interviews people are like, oh, why did it take 10 years? But yeah. I think I'm more curious about do you see a shift in the landscape of filmmaking or independent filmmaking, uh, you know, you know, from going from your debut to second feature, but also as... Um, a British woman and like a British Arab woman yeah. do you see a shift in terms of filmmaking and, and you know yeah well I was feeling really optimistic because um, you know when I it, it feels like when I made My Brother the Devil I was on lots of these panels which were like oh the statistics it's so awful there's not enough women and I didn't know I was a female filmmaker until I'd made mm. My Brother the Devil and people kept asking me about being a female filmmaker mm. because I'd just been desperate to make a film mm. And that adjective, female, had never even come into the equation for me. And I kept being asked, why have you made a film about men mm. as a female filmmaker? And I was like, I don't know, maybe hiding that it's not me? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, it was only in retrospect you look back and realise these things. So I was very aware of it then. And it feels like there's been more awareness around this. There's been more effort from the industry. I'm certainly aware of a lot of really interesting female um, Arab filmmakers who are coming up, who've made amazing films that I'm a fan of, and likewise in the UK. And then just yesterday, um, I was told about the Bird's Eye View report that came yeah. out yeah. that actually say that in the last year it's been worse again. It's gone down since, 6%. I think it's, it's gone down since 2019, so a lot get, gets compared with pre-2020 because of, of the pandemic. Uh, and so when we are watching films and we're looking at what's coming out, and we're all really excited and Chloe Tsao won an Oscar and, and yeah. look at all these excellent films by women, um, actually there's been a decline. It's just that the films that women work on now are possibly just featured more they're sort of more spotlighted but actually um it's gone down since 2019. yeah that's what i i became aware of yesterday actually mm. and then thought oh maybe it hasn't changed yeah. <laughs> and really my only um reaction to that was the same as how i felt right after my brother the devil which was i can't really think about it. i just have to keep making films mm. for me and what i want to do because it feels like it's my passion and it's what I want to do with my life mm. um, and dedicate to and, and hope that's in some way helps and eases the path and makes it easier for others and mm. supporting others coming up, mentoring. I've done a fair bit of mentoring over the last 10 years as well. Um, but yeah, to speak on that 10 year gap, as some people call it, <laughs> um, it's not actually a gap. And, you know, swimmers took four years to make. Mm. So in the six years prior to that, um, I think right after My Brother the Devil, the effort of making that film, I actually got very ill mm -hmm. immediately after. And that was the toll that it took health-wise. Mm -hmm. um, and then I directed some telly and began writing some more features that I was trying to get made and get off the ground. And those um, are hard. Um, I, I had hoped after My Brother the Devil that it'd be easier, yeah. but it wasn't. Okay. And. Um, when Swimmers came across my desk, I had been working on this one particular project for many, many years, mm. um, pushing it forward with little bits of development support um, uh, to keeping it going. Um, and then the other thing was having a child, yeah. which I think um, people sometimes um, want to airbrush the career of a, a filmmaker yeah. <laughs> and being a woman as a filmmaker. And when you reach a certain age, you know, that question is very potent, like, and, and I'm a believer in living life. Mm. You know, I'm not someone who sits and studies films in order to make films. I, I like to have a very involved and varied life. Mm -hmm. And that's what really informs the films I want to make and really helps me with, ultimately with my filmmaking. Mm. And um, having a child has really helped um, that. But it doesn't come without its constraints. And, 
you know, I'm very lucky that I've got a partner who's super supportive and we've both taken that productivity hit and try to share it 50-50. Yeah. But unless you are loaded with money, I don't know how you could put all your time into filmmaking and have a family or kids. Mm. Um, the economics just doesn't work. Yeah, I think you're it's absolutely right in terms of expectations of a filmmaker. Um, I don't think people think of, about them having a life outside <laughs> of being on set, you know, and um, well, I'm really, yeah, really glad that you're sort of back on it. <laughs> um, I think also what I wanted to ask was, um, when writing your scripts, um, and in particular The Swimmers, which you co-wrote with Jack Thorne, is the sort of, because you mentioned um, Arabic language, and in that scene as well, we saw some code switching and, and you know, use of Arabic as well. What other sort of practical things you think of or need to work on when you're writing a script in two languages or incorporating more than one language in a, in a film? Yeah, it was it was a constant discussion because before we were with Netflix, we were actually with um, a different um, studio and they weren't as comfortable with me bringing the Arabic into the film. Okay. Um, and so there was a lot of discussion about how this was going to work and, you know, they were concerned about audience. But when Netflix came on board, actually, because they have a global audience, um, they when I said, oh, by the way, this is a bilingual film and there's a lot of it in Arabic, um, they were fine with it. Mm. And I think that shows how the streamers are affecting, and, and the, now that there is a global audience, are affecting the filmmaking in a positive way, certainly for a film like Swimmers. Mm. And Swimmers was, in my mind, always going to be a bilingual film because the girls are bilingual. Um, it was important that in Syria they speak Arabic because mm -hmm. that's authentic and real. Um, although in Syria they did speak English to each other. Mm -hmm. And it, um, they spoke English with their friends sometimes. And that was something we tried to establish from the start of the film was th their ability to be comfortable in both mm -hmm. spaces. Yeah. And then once they went on the journey, because of the numbers of nationalities of refugees in that larger group they traveled with, the main language was English mm -hmm. when they were traveling. And then interestingly, there's a psychological dimension to language as well that comes into this and that also came into My Brother the Devil, and you can see in that scene. Um, but Yusra and Sara, when they got to Germany, because they didn't speak German, they spoke to all the Germans they were dealing with and Sven in English initially mm. until they learned the language, but initially in the time frame of the movie. And then when it was just the two of them, because they spent all day chatting to everybody in English, they found sometimes it was uncomfortable to switch back to Arabic okay. because it made them homesick and mm. it made them sad mm. and it made them think of their family. And so they would maintain that English between them because it felt like they could talk about things without it searing their heart, ultimately. Yeah. Um, so it was finding that balance, um, like much in The Swimmers, there's a lot of things being balanced mm. and it felt right in very emotional scenes that anger and emotion, you switch back straight to your native tongue, of course, Arabic, mm. but there are other moments where you just are in the flow of dealing with daily life yeah. where English was okay. Mm. So there are psychological yeah. angles yeah. as well to, to, to the language. Associating the language with your experience. And it, it's working with the actors to find that. Mm. So the, you know, I had a script that was all in English um, and then we had an Arabic translation um, done by our associate producer Hassan Akkad, who's from Damascus, and he did that in a Damascene accent. Okay. So we had the Arabic portions translated and then they were bolded. But then my prep with all my lead actors is to sit down and go through every word in the script in advance and anything that doesn't quite flow, feel natural mm. to them, make tweaks and which language things should be in and where we should split the English and Arabic and even within lines was something that was discussed okay. and analysed. Mm. And um, I think in terms of the swimmers and staying with that is, you know, it's it's a it's an incredibly gorgeous film. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's it's a stunning film. Um, I had the pleasure of watching it on the big screen when it came out, and uh, you're you know fully immersed in it. But beyond it being incredible storytelling and you know a nuanced story and and visually stunning, there's there's um, a cause there, right? And there's like raising awareness. Um, you know, why? Did you feel that that was, you know, the refugee crisis and the story was the one that would be your next project? Like, why did that feel important to you? 
Yeah, so I, like I said, was working on something completely different. Mm. Um, and, you know, it wasn't that this was something that I had been learning to tell or make myself, mm. but when Working Title contacted me with a script, um, I had been in the mode of saying no to everything that was coming my way because I was hunkering down on my own thing that was really finally, after many years mm. of work, coming together. Um, and so when my agent sent me the script, he said, oh, Working Title have been in touch. It's about these two Syrian refugees, their sisters. And I didn't, I knew nothing really initially uh, that it was Yusra because I'd actually heard of Yusra. She'd been in the news mm. at the time of Rio and I remember seeing some news reports about her. But I didn't realise it was her um, initially. And he said, oh, look, I know you're going to say no, but this Working Title had actually sent me another script that I'd said no to. Mm -hmm. And he said, you really ought to read it and maybe have a meeting with them so they don't take it personally when you say no. And I said, yeah, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. And so I just picked it up and thought, I'll just flick through this and let me just read this really quickly because I've got so much on my plate right yeah. now. And I read it and I ended up reading the whole script and it sounds so corny because I got off the, f uh, like I got to the end of the script and I thought, okay, I have to put my baby on hold if I do this. I really relate to these young women. Went on Google, saw the real Yusra and Sara, made the connection, mm. you know, that I had seen Yusra saw some interviews with real Yusra and Sara, and they just reminded me of me, mm. and they reminded me of me when I was growing up in Cairo. They reminded me of my friends and people I knew, and I thought, oh, if I don't do this film, I hope whoever does do it uh, really does it justice, yeah. because there deserves to be like heroic young women like this on screen. Yeah, and the refugee stuff, and <laughs> the sibling relationship, which I really relate to. And then I thought, yeah, I just imagine myself sitting in a cinema watching the film and having a feeling of disappointment. <laughs> and I thought, oh no, <laughs> I've got to do it. It's going to ruin it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that sounds awfully like, but it was because I think I just related to them so much, yeah. knew who they were and thought, I better do it. So I called my agent and told him and he was just shocked. <laughs> um, yeah, so, it, so that was how that came about. And then you always want the politics to be with a lowercase p. Yeah. You know, ultimately this is um, a medium where you know, certainly with The Swimmers, my ambition was an entertaining film mm -hmm. that would maybe reach an audience that wouldn't go and watch the documentary about yeah. the Syrian refugee. Um, and it, I thought I saw in Yusra and Sara that young, youthful spirit and wanted to make a film for the 16 year old me, basically, mm -hmm. um, who would have been inspired by it. So not um, trying to be too clever, mm. I guess, in, in in a way, mm. um, trying to make something that was accessible, getting myself out of the way of the story. Um, and then when we started working on the film, Sara got arrested mm. and it, her, you know, she was in prison for over a hundred days in Athens. It was crazy wow. because she'd been this amazing wow. volunteer in Lesbos and then suddenly she was arrested. And we'd already agreed, you know, the timeline of the movie was them as ordinary Syrian girls to the Olympics. Mm. And so, um, Seeing that unfold, I think it just, uh, meeting other refugees, meeting, you know, the Syrian refugees that ended up working on the film with us. Mm -hmm. um, I just, there were a lot of things that I wanted in there, a bit like My Brother the Devil, you know, yeah. the more you go into something, the more you think that needs to be there, at least thematically. Mm. And and you know, holding on to that feeling of watching something on the big screen and, and, and you know, doing a story justice, what is it that you... When you think of your audience, what is it that you hope that they walk away with when they watch your films? Yeah, that's why the endings of films are so important mm. because I think that that last beat um, is what you as a filmmaker are leaving an audience with. It's often the overriding memory and emotion from a mm. film is that very last moment. And so in both films, I mean, well, in my first, in My Brother the Devil, I knew the feeling, the bittersweet kind of feeling. Not everything is resolved, but there is this small ray of hope mm -hmm. because there's some kind of um, reconciliation, I suppose, between the brothers. Yeah. Um, and I knew the emotion and the feeling of that, but then it was very hard work to work out how to put that feeling and emotion I wanted the audience to have in their belly into a scene. So it was doing it that way. And then with Swimmers, it was very much... Um, wanting Sarah's um, case to have some attention mm -hmm. and it, to shine a light on the statistics and 
slightly be like a bit of a call to arms. I mean, I was kidding myself through the whole making of the swimmers thinking, I don't want this to be the refugee movie. I don't want this to be the refugee movie. I want this to be the movie that's about young women who are like all young women and find those universalities like mm. in their lives and things that make them like everyone and that people can connect to the sisters um, through their humor and um, mm. spirit and um, personalities. And so I was really leaning into all that stuff and trying to tell the larger story more visually in shots where it's like suddenly you see the life jackets or yeah. you see the scale, you know, but um, ultimately I wanted the audience to be very intimate with the characters so mm. that they felt that those girls were them or they were on the journey with them and um, that those young women are ordinary people like you and me and then maybe afterwards to reflect upon the fact that anyone can be a refugee. Yeah. So that that was the hope with with swimmers. Thank you so much. And I think we we're running out of time. So my my last question is that you've you've been so generous in talking about challenges and rejection and <laughs> just the the reality of um, filmmaking, which I think. Um, I would just assume is very, very hard. And I think, you know, um, that my assumption is that there are quite a lot of barriers, but what advice do you have to sort of aspiring filmmakers that might just be going out now hoping to, you know, make a film and are facing the first challenges? Yeah, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Mm. I mean, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an overnight, like things can happen for some people overnight. But my story is that it wasn't for me, never has been for me. Yeah. So I like to work with the compass, not the clock, and to, to just um, do me and make your own path and to know that it's not an overnight process, actually. Mm. And it's, it's a life's work, and you're constantly learning from everything you're experiencing and um, towards that aim and that goal. Um, so to be patient because um, sometimes if you're too if you're impatient you can end up um, blowing kind of the opportunities so you only have one chance to make your first film mm -hmm. you only have one chance to make your second film make them films that you are truly proud of so the way you do that is by having patience mm -hmm. and making sure that all factors are right and the conditions are right as best as you can make them I think that's an excellent note to end on. <laughs> and uh, The Swimmers is available to watch on Netflix if you haven't seen it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to Netflix and BFI South Bank and The Summit for having us and to Sally Husseini. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. <laughs>